Never stop recording. Yeah. <laughs> ABR, always be recording. Hello, and welcome back to TPI's podcast, To Think Minimum. I'm Chris McGurn, TPI's Director of Communications. Each week on this podcast, we facilitate a conversation between TPI fellows and special guests on some of the most pressing and important issues in tech policy and tech politics. This week's episode features a very important conversation on infrastructure. For the past couple of years, tech companies have been very good at convincing consumers that our wireless cloud-based ecosystem is just that, wireless and cloud-based without any sort of physical components to it. That, of course, is not the case, though it might not necessarily still be the series of tubes as it was famously called once upon a time. I'm not sure that's the companies that have been convincing people of that. Oh, yeah? It's, it's important to them. They try to convince people that uh, that that the, how much they try to show people how much infrastructure is required. I guess it depends whether you're talking about policy people or consumers. I was talking more about consumers. Um, I mean, if you look at anything, you know, any of the major, you know, providers, they, they don't really talk about the infrastructure. They talk about how easy it is to get things up in the cloud and how it can move around with you. Um, they don't really talk about the fact that they require, you know, server farms and, you know, the networks and the, you know, actual infrastructure of, of those components. So there's a disconnect between DC and consumers. They just want con consumers, all consumers care about is how it works. Mm -hmm. and they don't want to know about the strings and, and wires and cables. But we want policymakers to know about those strings and wires and cables that are, rel that are required to make all of it work. E that, exactly. And uh -huh. I think that the language that's used when these companies are talking to consumers is very different than when they're talking to policymakers. Mm -hmm. um, Probably as it should be. Yeah, when they're talking to consumers, you know, if you look at your, you know, ISP bill every month, it doesn't say, well, we need to, you know, expand our reach out into rural parts of the country, so we're going to charge you, you know, ten bucks more a month. But when they talk to policymakers, you know, the the nuts and bolts of how much it costs to actually wire people's houses is definitely top of mind for them. That's true. Although um, dividing up uh, what what costs are for what, what expenses are for what is a difficult accounting problem. Um, it's always hard to know what's what's really for what. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that all being said is a great segue into the fact that tonight is also the President's first State of the Union address where infrastructure is going to be playing a huge role. Um, whether or not broadband infrastructure or general tech infrastructure is going to be uh, discussed, I don't know, but he, in a $1 trillion package, hopefully there's some, some funding there. Um, and to talk about this more are Sarah O, oh, who is TPI's fel uh, TPI fellow, and Scott Walston, you've already heard from, uh, TPI senior fellow and president, and they're going to discuss this issue in a bit more detail. Do we have a special guest this week? Not this week. <laughs> <laughs> We're all special guests. Yeah. Yeah. Very special. yeah. The, the aim is to get special guests eventually, so... Um, before we get to the president's um, discussion of infrastructure, this morning the Subcommittee on Communications and Technology up at, on Capitol Hill is holding a hearing titled Closing the Digital, Digital Divide, Broadband Infrastructure Solutions. So Scott, um, do you know about what they're talking about? Why are they focusing on um, broadband infrastructure? What's the problem and why should we care? Well, the hearing is actually going on as we speak. We can see it um, playing uh, on the uh, on the. We were watching the video stream, which shows you know how important it is to actually uh, be paying attention in real time, which we're not um, because we know what everyone's going to say already. Uh, but they're they're focused on it because uh, rural broadband is still an issue, and even though we're doing rural broadband is a, a, a lot better than it's being made out to be these days. Um, it's still not nearly as good as it is in urban area or urban or suburban areas, um, and we decided as a society that we want everyone to have some minimum level of service. And so the question is, how to do that? How to do that in a cost-effective way? Well, the private sector is currently investing over seventy-five billion dollars per year. Um, what's holding them back from investing more in rural areas? Is there an, an, a need, is that the market failure argument or um, is it just that demand is low in rural areas? Um, I think it's, I think this is not a market failure. Um, a market failure is that um, if you take into account the total benefits, they are uh, less than the private benefits, the benefits to the firm alone. Um, and if they could take into account all the total benefits, they might exceed the cost, and then they'd want to do it. That's a market failure. In this case, it's not clear that it's a market failure, um, because the societal benefits from increasing speeds in rural areas 
um, are probably not a lot bigger than the private benefits. And even to the extent that they are, those benefits should accrue to the network that invests in them as well, which makes it not technically a market failure. Um, and you know, that goes to one of the, it, one of the reasons for universal service, uh, the idea of universal service. It's not just to solve a market failure, it's to meet some kind of uh, both equity and political objectives. Uh, the equity objectives are that uh, that we've decided, like I said, that we want everybody to have some minimum level of some kind of service. And the political objectives, of course, is that politicians like to give to constituents money. Yeah, but in this case, is that really happening? I mean, if you're taking taxing everyone at the same rate to invest in rural broadband and people like, you know, Lake Tahoe and, you know, Jackson Hole, Wyoming are the recipients, then is that really equitable or is that really working to the way it was designed to work? Absolutely not. Well, actually, those are two different questions. One, is it equitable? Um, no. Uh, we're taxing everybody the same amount um, which and redistributing it to everybody, no matter whether they're rich or poor. Sorry, rural people, whether they're rich or poor. Actually, I shouldn't even say rural people. It's rural uh, telecom companies. Um, how much the actual consumers benefit is a completely different question. Um, is it working the way it was designed to? Well, that's a harder question because it was probably really designed to benefit certain constituents, those constituents being um, owners of rural telephone companies. Not that I'm cynical, but not at all. Which brings us back to a topic we were just chatting about earlier. Um, related to infrastructure, maybe not broadband, but earmarks. So, Chris, you were um, just chatting about what it was like in Washington when you first moved here, um, when there was more um, earmark activity, what do you think? Yeah, well, once upon a time, infrastructure specifically was very bipartisan in the sense that it was more regional uh, than it was uh, partisan. So people from the South would all band together to get infrastructure packages passed, and the Midwest would do the same. Uh, you don't really see that anymore. Um, the last real um, bill that focused on this topic was probably um, about 10 years ago, and um, that was highly partisan and controversial. Um, and now, um, w without even the earmarks, you can't even get the pet projects to you know, support have members of Congress, you know, support larger p packages anymore. Um, so whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think there are arguments on both sides. But uh, certainly there was a different way that it worked last time, and you could say that there were more um, more positive legislation coming out of Congress when, when it was possible to have earmarks. Sarah, how do you think earmarks um, might, if earmarks came back, how might that affect investment in broadband and other kinds of technology? Do you think it might? Well, I'm currently um, divided on the pork barrel spending issue and earmarks. Um, the, what I learned um, in law school and economics courses was that it's a it's a waste pork barrel um, pork. But now that um, Congress doesn't have earmarks, it seems that there's less cooperation and just less. Um, uh, deal making. So it seems like pork might be kosher. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm kind of thinking that actually earmarks might be uh, beneficial, even if they're costly um, in terms of waste, like a center for some pet project in some small town, like $600 million. Um, now I'm thinking, well, if it allows Congress to put together reasonable trillion dollar packages, uh, you know, then maybe maybe that's a cost that um, we as a society have to make. But it's you interesting ask, you might yeah. um, think that a, a trillion dollar package could be reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Okay, well, maybe, that, maybe not. Um, you asked me about rural broadband in connection to earmarks, I mm -hmm. think, in your question. Um, well, in terms of federal spending, the Universal Service Fund spends $8 billion per year, much of which goes acts similarly to earmarks, um, at least to rural broadband providers. Um, there are recurring payments going out to ISPs around the country um, who, I, I don't know what they're building. A lot of that funding is going to overhead, and we still hear that rural communities don't have um, a lot of broadband. So I'm not sure. 
um, should Congress gift uh, an earmark of you know X million dollars to a certain rural broadband provider? Um, I, I don't think so, but um, I, I, I'm still well, thinking. This, yeah. this is a, I mean, this is kind of a rhetorical question, but um, if we were spending this much money uh, and four and a half billion of the Universal Service Fund plus several hundred million from the Rural Utilities Service uh, and other uh, funds that go to rural health care and schools and so on. Um, if service is still as bad as people say, despite all of this money that we've been spending for years and years and years, um, probably a total of you know close to $100 billion now in real dollars, um, what is the justification for spending more? I mean, I said it's a rhetorical question, but, but yeah. still, maybe, you know, tell us what people, what, what, right. what, what do you hear? What do people say? Well, the argument is that, well, federal stimulus um, will fill the gap that private industry isn't filling. So um, an infrastructure bill could, you know, double the amount the private sector is spending, like $70 billion a year, um, and therefore stimulate our economy. It sounds a little bit. But now you're you're moving to now you're moving to a general statement about infrastructure, yes, not about broadband. Broadband, right? Although, right. Well, I mean, as a society, if we wanted fiber everywhere, um, we would just pay for it, and it would be fiber in the ground. Um, so I don't I don't I don't think it would be um, a smart move, a smart use of money, um, allocating federal funds from a central decision maker is ripe for um, miscalculation. How, how are we supposed to know where to put fiber down and spend the money? It sounds a little bit Chinese, <laughs> like state-owned enterprises just building buildings and building highways to nowhere. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's not what we do here in the U.S., hopefully not. Well, we'll wait and see if we do nationalize the 5G network to shift from broadband to wireless for a second. Yeah, that was a that was an that was an interesting proposal. Um, who knew the day would start with uh, nationalizing our telecommunications network yesterday? Yeah. Uh, Sarah, what did you make of that? Um, well, I first thought that the slide deck. I clicked on the slide deck Sunday night. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that the the link from Twitter, and I, I read it on my little phone, <laughs> the little slide deck. Um, it, I didn't know what to make of it. There was no marking on the, the presentation. There was no date stamp on it. And um, being someone who has spent a lot of time in government documents, I thought that document looked very familiar, like a low level like outline for a strategy. It did not seem like a policy making document. Um, so, you know, I was that's actually that's an interesting that's a really interesting point um, I think because also having spent time in government um, people in government there are a lot of people in government you know they really believe in what they're doing and they will put together a proposal for something and it might be one of the stupidest things you've ever seen but that person meant well of course on the other hand in this administration we don't see a lot of very professional documents so it's sort of hard to say what level this was <laughs> <laughs> right yeah Maybe they'll just put all the 5G towers along the wall that they want to build on the southern border, and then you know at least San Antonio will have 5G everywhere. Well, also that would, that's that's brilliant because then they would provide service on the Mexican side, and Mexicans can subscribe to the service, and perhaps that way because we'll tax them to pay for our universal service fund, maybe that will pay for the wall. All right, only a few hours until the State of the <laughs> Union. Let's rush us to the White House see what they say about it. Yep. But that does raise another question. Um, that I had was, um, so we talked about why funding, um, what's, what's the point of funding more? Um, I know you asked rhetorically, but could it be that just demands increased, I mean, from when they first started laying down broadband to now, I mean, obviously with, you know, Internet of Things popping up with more and more people connected to more and more devices, is there an argument to be made that because there's more demand now that we need to keep up with the capacity? Uh, so you're asking whether we need more investment um, be as a result of uh, kind of new things our telecommunications network is is used for. Um, that's a good point because it, they do require ongoing investments and upgrades. Uh, but we we also know that the rural universal service um, has never been effective. It was it most studies show that it was it had almost no impact on the ch number of households that had telephone service that, during the time when it covered phone service. Um, the General uh, Government Accounting Office 
and uh, other government agencies have asked it to be more transparent um, and to set you know measurable goals and and so on. So uh, you're making I think you're making a good point that we shouldn't assume that once something is built, it's built forever and that's all we ever need because we know that from the industry's ongoing investment. Um, but it still needs to be. Uh, it, it, it needs to be possible to evaluate it, and so that should be built into the into the into the system. Well, let me ask you a question, Chris. Um, since you know, I think be, uh, before you came here, uh, telecom broadband and technology wasn't your your main focus. So, when you hear us talking about um, about this issue and uh, and sort of and, and then that there, there, there's this waste and that it's not effective, um, what do you what 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 do you think? I mean, is your reaction generally why are we still spending so much money on this, or is it like you said before? Well, maybe it's just because there was never enough money in the first place, or um, are that you think we're crazy, uh, or I mean, what sort of what's a general reaction from somebody who um, kind of knows how DC works, but hasn't been following this issue for um, their entire professional life like we have, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> well. You guys might be crazy, but that's what a PhD in economics would do for you, I think. Um, yeah, so you know, I've never been as deep into this issue uh, previously, like you mentioned, but you know, it is a very hot topic, and it's been a hot topic um, as long as I've been in DC, which is two thousand what since two thousand and three. Um, back then, you know, there was a lot of conversations going on. Uh, it was sort of like at the cusp of switching from dial-up to broadband connections. Um, in 2000. Yeah, yes. 2000, 2003. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, I remember the first office I worked in, only one person was online at a time, and it was still the old, you know, modem dial-up, and it was just grading. So, um, you know, I think the context I would provide is, you know, it's only been, you know, 20, 15, 20 years, and so it seems like a lot has been built and a lot has been developed in that time. Um, and from a consumer perspective, uh, you know, like I mentioned, uh, we're using a lot more devices now and so for someone who doesn't understand this stuff it's like well as long as it works at the end we don't really care how much it costs we'll gripe about our our bills every month but we don't really care as long as we can stream netflix without it buffering and we can you know also be checking wikipedia and also you know asking alexa things um, how much you do care about your bill right? yeah um, yeah i mean so everybody's going to is going to make that trade-off between their bill and how much they can stream yeah. and to the extent that there's a connection between the cost and how much you pay care yeah that, that's true we certainly do and so that comes back to you know whether or not the government needs to pay more money or if the private companies have to pay more money and what the balance between that is uh, because at the either end, way consumers are paying yeah I mean consumers are paying I mean you know and not only that but I mean consumers are paying for broadband every consumer is also paying for wireless um, and they're paying a fair chunk I think my first wireless bill was 40 bucks a month and now I'm paying over 100 yeah on but a monthly. think about what you can do with your wireless now that you couldn't do that well, I can't flip it open anymore and that's a shame but yeah that's true that's too bad you um, also can't knock someone out with your phone they're too small yeah so yeah I mean so I, I think that's what to get back to your uh, question Scott is um, it seems like it's a lot of money but on balance given where else the government spends money it doesn't seem like a terribly wasteful amount so uh, so I think you're telling us, uh, you're saying to us, good God, look at the bigger picture. It might be waste, but compared to what other things, other waste in, in government and what we spend, it's it's really not, it's not much. Yeah, Is that what you're saying? Pretty much. So what we do is worthless. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's right. too, too far. Well, maybe that's a good time to talk about the president's uh, proposed, there is a document that is online about some proposed infrastructure initiatives from the president. And that document mostly covers like traditional infrastructure, waterways, highways, bridges. Um, American infrastructure is um, in need of repair around the country. And that is very capital intensive, um, far more than, oh, and um, kind of safety focused, like everyday people driving over bridges. Um, so the president's document um, only has one line for rural broadband, um, but mostly focuses on major infrastructure. Um, what do you think? Do you think broadband will make it into any infrastructure initiatives? Well, actually, I, I think it's important to think a little bit about the bigger bigger picture, and you, you said that tends to focus on 
um, bridges and roads and waterways and, and, and so on. Um, and, you know, if anybody who's driven around, let's say, New York City, for example, knows the problems in the infrastructure as her car goes through pothole after pothole after pothole uh, and sees the, the, the bridges. But on the other hand, I, I'd be I'm very skeptical about, uh, I wouldn't take at face value the claims about how bad it is and how much money is needed. Whenever somebody sees, uh, anybody who's, who's, who wants money is going to say they need lots of it. Uh, so you can, you can be sure that the amounts that people say are needed are overstated. Uh, on the other hand, though, certain types of infrastructure, say um, water, uh, water provision, is the, the economics of, it, of them are terrible. Uh, whether it's privately owned or publicly owned, it doesn't matter. And the reason is because a water system, once it's built, can run most more or less forever with not forever, can, can run for a long time with very little investment. Um, but at some point, it's going to need big chunks of investment along the way. And you know, well, to, to, if, if a pipe ruptures, and ideally you want to you know make sure that those pipes don't rupture. And what that means is that they have to charge enough. Uh, to be able to pay for those things when they happen and to do sufficient maintenance along the line. But that means that they're going to, those um, utilities will have to maintain some kind of pots of, of money. And they're called quasi rents because it looks like they're earning profits, but they're really not because they'll have to be spent later. And the problem is nobody likes big pots of money. Politicians see them and then they want to use that money for uh, other things around, you know, other, other priorities. If it's a private uh, company, then the investors don't want the money to just sit there. So whether it's publicly owned or privately owned, the economics are terrible. So while I am skeptical of the of the, of the size of the numbers people present of, of the need, um, it, it's true that the economics of lots of these types of infrastructures are, the incentives are really bad, and we need to be more thoughtful about um, making sure that they stay up, up to snuff. Right, I mean, I haven't, thought about this much, but to replace the water uh, system in Detroit, for instance, I mean, you have to pull up all those pipes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like a, every hundred years or something. Right, you exactly. You have to do that. And when you do it, it's expensive. Very expensive. I mean, all the pipes, that's very expensive. I'm gonna and that, that brings up another good point, you know, discussing all these figures and, you know, what it would cost. Um, you know, we, we mentioned earlier that there's a hearing going on right now on rural broadband. Uh, the president's offered his um, proposal of a trillion dollars, but there are also 25 other bills up uh, for discussion within Congress. Have you guys looked at those, or what are your thoughts on some of the proposals that are floating around currently? Well, I read the document that's um, circulating for today's um, subcommittee hearing, and Many of them were introduced last year in 2017. They're small pieces of legislation about improvements to certain programs. One particular bill, the LIFT Act, seemed quite ambitious. Um, it talked about setting aside um, money for broadband deployment, 75% through a reverse auction mechanism and 25% through statewide um, reverse auction for next generation 911 services. Um, I am a little bit new to reading legislative proposals. It seems like for every one piece of legislation that is successful, there are maybe 200 mm -hmm. proposals, maybe more, um, I don't know. Um, so but if you just you have to remember to look in the background of the um, I'm just a bill uh, <laughs> uh, short, you can see all the bills that didn't get through the line. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, is it, yeah, are the odds better or worse than venture capital? <laughs> Getting a bill through? It's a good question. Know. Comparing bills to venture capital. Yeah, 100 bills to one that passes. Um, but in any event, 25 bills up for discussion, at least um, at least the proposals write down uh, possibilities for how to, I guess, appropriate funds. Um, I don't know about broadband deployment. $40 billion is over 10 times the amount that was in the stimulus bill. So one of my papers is on $3 billion of infrastructure spending from the Recovery Act. And I look at 100 projects that spent the $3 billion, um, trying to track down, well, what was built from that $3 billion. And so 
when I look at a number like $40 billion, I kind of wonder, well, what are they going to do with that money and how will they distribute it? Yeah, I think that um, you know, that raises a few things. One is that <clears throat> so if you recommend giving away this money, you've got to think about um, how you will give it away and how to make sure you get the biggest bang for the buck. Um, and that sounds like an awful lot of money. But on the, on the positive side, uh, reverse auctions, which is probably the best way to, to distribute this money, now seems to be coming mainstream um, despite opposition for so many years. Um, and that's, that's a very, very good thing. Um, but on the other hand, and in, in some sense, this isn't a fair criticism because this is about infrastructure, but we're spending all of this time and effort and money uh, focusing on rural broadband when if you really want to get more people online, if your focus is getting people online, um, it's income that's the biggest uh, determinant, not where you, not, not where, whether you're rural or urban. Um, and we should be spending more effort on how to help low-income people get online. And that doesn't mean just adding money to the Lifeline program. It means more work, more research on why people aren't online, because it turns out to be complicated if you look at the uh, pilots that the FCC did a few years ago. Um, do we need to do, we, didn't, we need more experiments. Uh, we need to be, have better understanding of, of what might get people online and what they would what what they what they what they want to do and and what and uh, what sort of government services uh, could be available and, and so on, um, and we should be focusing our efforts there. That's where we'll where we'll make where we could make a difference. Right. So the adoption part of the discussion, not just deployment. Exactly. Yeah. Um, how about? Poll attachments and rights of way. Should Congress be thinking about legislation to help infrastructure in that area? That's. I, I saw one bill that had a mention of a right of way. Well, I think we should we should hear your opinion first because this is partly a legal question. I mean, we know rights of way and poll attachments. On the one hand, it sounds like just about the most boring topic you could ever discuss. I mean, really, it's hard to imagine something more boring. But they're really important. Um, and if you want companies to put up uh, small cells, um, extend wires, they need those things. Um, yeah. And the question is how to get it. And also, but it begins to get into questions of federalism um, and versus you know, versus economics. And we, we you know, cities, uh, municipalities do have real concerns. You don't want people you know, digging up your streets every other day. Um, but you know, Sarah, you've got a, a JD also, so you should you should know something about federalism more than you yeah. should know more than I do. So what what are, what are your thoughts? Well, we could do a whole program on poll attachments. That'd be <laughs> so lame. <laughs> um, but there are proposals. I was surprised. I think Verizon is supporting a one build um, campaign. So just um, allowing company. Uh, what is it? Allowing companies to build once and share poll polls, um, which I was surprised by um, because in terms of federalism, you don't want to override municipalities from controlling um, poll attachments or rights of way um, too, too differently um, in a fragmented way. But I heard from someone else, I mean, maybe we can bring on some guests, but that polls are kind of dumb infrastructure and that th I, it, that's how they're rationalizing it, that it doesn't take much smarts to build um, to build polls for, um, for attaching fiber and therefore there should be some uniform um, rules on all the polls in the country. Um, well, yeah, I mean, but those, those rules are, have to include lots of things because you, you know, different types of lines um, have to be you know a certain distance apart so they don't have you know so that their signals don't interfere with each other, um, and so there are you know there are also technical uh, rules. But technical rules uh, are are usually given as just a reason to not do something, and there's there's very often um, an actual uh, solution. So when somebody says it's a technical problem, um, as Tom Hazlett said in his book, uh, his new book, so frequently it's there it's it's often just a, a way to block something. Mm -hmm. But there are I mean there are rules. You don't want to put your you know usually the gas line is um, on the other side of the street from the electricity line. And you know, that kind of makes sense. Um, 
So, you know, <laughs> some of the rules do make sense. Yeah, but when you're dealing with 80,000 municipalities who each have a town council and each want some sort of, um, I don't know, kickback or um, who can block build out, um, I, I can see the reason for wanting some uniformity across the country. For well, let me just ask, um, because you were great, uh, proceeding to bump your elbow after giving the very intelligent lawyerly slash economic answer but for you know the person sitting at home what do the poll attachments and rights of way mean to their service for the end user mm, that's a good question uh, so the infrastructure needs to get to your house somehow um, if if it's your you know cell phone signal there's got to be a tower near enough that can give you a, a strong enough signal. If it's your wired home broadband, a wire's got to come to your house, and that means it's got to, you know, come down the street and go you know, all the way to your house. And you know, how does it how does how does it get there? Well, um, if you're lucky, everything's all the wires are underground, um, and so you you don't you don't see them. But that means it's hard. You've got to dig up the street uh, to put new new cables down there. Um, more typically, especially in older place, older communities, uh, they're up, they're up on literally on poles, and um, all the wires there. You look up and you see this you know hideous maze of wires and wooden poles, and you need a way. Companies need a way. Providers need a way to attach their their cables there, and um, there needs to be some order to it. Uh, but you also want them to be able to. If nobody could attach a new wire to it, let's say the electricity company owns the cable, uh, the poles, and won't let anyone put a new any other wires on it, you're not going to have any wired broadband um, unless you get permission to dig up the street and put a cable there. And of course, that's a lot more expensive and also difficult. You still got to go through the town. Um, so you know the the trade off the trade offs are on the one hand you could make it a complete free for all and you'd probably you know, you'd get lots more cables but then that would cause more disruption in the street you could have interference in the lines um, but if you make it too restrictive you won't get any improvements mm -hmm. yeah and i mean mentioning the the number of 80,000 municipalities it seems like they would all want better connectivity for their citizens though what are the arguments you hear about why municipalities might put the kibosh on letting you know more rights of way and poll attachments in their towns? Well, um, for municipal governments, I guess it's a great way to have some pressure on providers to offer other services. So um, I think there's a lot of back and forth. Well, if if we're nice to you in this area and let you build out fiber, will you help our schools? Um, or will you um, support this program that we're, um, we're doing over here? And so municipalities have a lot of leverage over um, builders um, of infrastructure to get other benefits. And so um, I think that's definitely part of the conversation. It's not easy um, for providers to build systems when they're dealing with um, all sorts of different local governments. Um, and when I talk to my friends about, well, why, why doesn't the cable company build out faster? Um, why can't we be like Google and just build it? Well, um, part of the value of these cable companies is that they do work with so many municipalities. I mean, I, I kind of think that cable companies are kind of holders of thousands of contracts and relationships with towns. Yeah, that's the legacy of their franchise uh, agreements that they had to make with each town to, to launch cable service originally. And with Google, I mean, remember Google had a um, you know had cities compete with each other, and part of those part of what cities offered was um, easier access to. Um, to polls and, and rights of ways. Um, mm -hmm. And that's certainly not a criticism of Google because they needed those things to build out service. Yeah, and I think we're touching very close to an issue that Congress is talking a lot about, policymakers are, is where where do you start defining these big companies like Google as public utilities as opposed to private entities? Are we there yet? Is that a good idea, terrible idea? Because it seems like you're talking a terrible lot about- idea. Terrible idea. Terrible, I, terrible, I have a feeling you'd idea. say that. Um, <laughs> But if you're talking about the physical infrastructure and you're talking about the footprint these companies have, it seems like there are a lot of issues that are popping up. So, terrible idea. Well, there, 
Sorry, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Well, I think part of the appeal of the Google, Amazon, Apple is that they're able to scale and grow so quickly um, and dynamically. But that doesn't happen at the municipal level. So the traditional companies that have to deal with town councils, they can't grow that quickly because there's so many um, levels of ab obstruction <laughs> and so much zoning and so much um, kickbacks and um, so it's it's a different uh, world of public utility, um, I, I guess, political economy. Yeah, I mean, there are different aspects of it. Uh, you know, public utilities were traditionally, um, you know, industries uh, that evolved very, very slowly. Um, and their you know regulation could take could take time and you know we made, there were lots of mistakes in the regulation over time and, and so on but uh, these were not uh, the, the rules associated were never uh, meant to apply to uh, industries that change so fast and um, uh, like the ones today they don't have just a single purpose um, but there is some overlap uh, they need the rights of ways just like a lot of the utilities did um, so, you know, it's not, it's, it, well, I think, you know, doing things like applying common carriage to them is not a good idea. Um, they need, they still need access to some of the same, uh, same rights of ways and polls that utilities do. Mm -hmm. I think it brings up two other newsworthy points. Um, Amazon HQ2 is looking for cities to host them, and so cities are offering these subsidies or tax credits. Um, and you also see cities um, in the discussion about um, Bill Gates is building a new city in Arizona that's highly connected. Um, I think the, some program. Who's going to live there? Uh, well, it'll be like Internet of Things, and it'll be all digital. And yeah, God, that sounds so terrible. It's a rebuild. <laughs> so there is discussion of how to get a, how to overcome old city regulations by either building new cities or. Um, enticing cooperation by bringing jobs in the cities. Yeah. Um, well, we're always going to have, um, there are always going to be NIMBY problems, not in my backyard. I mean, uh, every every community wants really good cellular service. Nobody wants a, t a cellular tower next to them. Um, and, you know, everybody wants, uh, you know, the fastest broadband coming to their house, but nobody wants their street to be dug up every day. Uh, and I mean, those are inconsistencies, but not crazy inconsistencies. I don't want those things. I mean, I want and don't want those things too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think it's a good discussion of public and private sector competence. Um, mm -hmm. Public utilities are fine for electricity or water. Um, maybe not even for electricity. I mean, people are trying to generate their own electricity through solar panels and bypass the electric grid. Um, so. And I think a public-private discussion um, for infrastructure is natural to talk about, well, who's best equipped to build out um, infrastructure? A pri the private sector or public sector? Um, Always edit. True. Never stop recording. Yeah. <laughs> ABR, okay, always be recording. I need a better computer. Okay. All right, so. Take two. Oh, that's right. I have all these other files on here. I'm gonna, anyway. All right.